So uh, hop in the hop in the back seat, and uh, and James is going to take us hopefully across the Sahara. So I'll see <laughs> you uh, in about forty five minutes, James. Maybe. Thanks a lot, Michael. <laughs> Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for joining me once again. Uh, as I mentioned, this is uh, my 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 journey on the Plymouth Dakar Challenge back in 2018, 2019. Now, for those of you who joined me last week, uh, you might remember that I didn't actually start from Plymouth and I didn't actually finish in Dakar. So I had to I had to sort of rename the challenge for myself. Uh, so I renamed it the Portsmouth Banjul Challenge because that was both where I started uh, and where I finished. Now, like any big thriller, uh, we had to end on a cliffhanger, didn't we? I, 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 had to, uh, I had to leave you all wanting more. So we're just going to have a little recap, a little photographic recap, uh, just to kind of give us an idea what happened last time. And for anybody who didn't join me, at least it will, uh, it will enable you uh, to see just what happened uh, in, in part one. So, of course, we started off with a £200 car, uh, a Peugeot 406. Uh, some fantastically magnificent engineering uh, by myself, uh, even if I do say. Uh, now, we also had a brief stop over in uh, Coto Doñana National Park in southern Spain. Uh, that resulted in lots and lots of wildlife, lots of bird species to see. Now, what I would say is actually there's a few new bird species uh, just here compared to last week. Uh, and the reason for that is I simply don't have time in the presentation to put in every species of bird that I photographed on the trip. Uh, otherwise, we'll all be here till 2022, uh, which you may or may not uh, appreciate. So, you know, birds like the white stork and the common kestrels and the lesser kestrel, uh, lots of common cranes in Coto Doniana as well. Lots of egrets, uh, little egret, cattle egret, great white egret, uh, the whole troop, so to speak. Great views of marsh areas out there as well. Uh, and of course, the magnificent hoopoe. Now, I probably should say that all of the, uh, the wildlife and the landscape photos in the presentation uh, are my own that I took on the trip, um, apart from any that I've kind of earmarked uh, otherwise. So hopefully you'll enjoy the, uh, the pictures I've got. So we also had some stormy seas across the Strait of Gibraltar. Lots and lots of seed thickness on that trip as well. Uh, but it should be said, not me. Uh, it turns out I've actually got quite good sea legs, which uh, I was rather pleased about. We had last minute citizenship, last minute emergency citizenship and the endless filling out of fiches. I never seem to stop filling out fiches in order to get me through all those uh, sort of road checkpoints. Now, we also had the highest mountains in North Africa, uh, those mountains in, the, in the, uh, the high Atlas in Morocco. Absolutely stunning location. I mean, if we're all ever allowed to go anywhere again, uh, then I heartily recommend uh, going to the high Atlas region in Morocco because it is stunningly beautiful. Uh, just absolutely superb. Now, of course, we also had impromptu desert roads, courtesy of Google Earth. Uh, this put us in some really remote desert locations, uh, just some fantastic uh, desert driving. Fortunately, we didn't get stranded there. We, uh, we found our way out again, uh, but we certainly had a lot of fun doing it. Of course, it took us through a disputed territory. Uh, that is the uh, disputed territory of Western Sahara. So Western Sahara, technically uh, quite a dangerous place to go. Uh, fortunately, you'll see we, we were actually following the coastal route in Western Sahara, uh, which is the green zone. So although it's not necessarily recommended uh, that you visit by the FCO, it's certainly not as bad as the, uh, the Sahel interior, which is, uh, is very much a no-go zone. Now, of course, as part of that, we had some beautiful coast, really, really stunning. And of course, there were... There was certainly nobody sunbathing, uh, no, no towels down there, that's for sure. This coast was absolutely uh, untouched by humans. Well, not untouched by humans, but there certainly weren't any there. Uh, we also crossed over the Tropic of Cancer. And of course, we undertook the Scrapyard Challenge. Well, I say we, uh, I certainly didn't, but some people undertook the Scrapyard Challenge to try and get an old stove working again. Now, of course, the result of the Scrapyard Challenge was, I'm sure you'll all remember from part one, yeah, it was a tent fire, everybody. The result of Scrapyard Challenge was a tent fire. So probably the moral of the story, what I would suggest is that if you are looking to cook on your journey, uh, don't use bits of old stove that you find from a scrapyard. Probably better to go with one that you know works and one that is less likely to set fire to your tent. So there we go. Now, of course, we finished up by entering the minefield in no man's land, uh, a pretty unique looking place, I have to say. Now, I was kind of hoping to have some great tea, 
and some great photos from the interior of no man's land but unfortunately getting out of the car i was i was sort of told in no uncertain terms that the middle of an active minefield was not a good place uh, to be indulging in photography so unfortunately i've got pretty much nothing to show you from the interior uh, but we did of course finish with the big explosion didn't we we finished on that cliffhanger everybody so what was the explosion well did we all survive well i'm sure you'll all be very not surprised sorry it's terrible english uh, you'll not be surprised to hear uh, that, that no people were killed uh, in the making of this adventure nobody was blown up by a landmine uh, but having said that we did hear an explosion uh, i just have no explanation for you i've absolutely no idea what it was uh, it was a little bit distant uh, and perhaps somebody was detonating a mine for some reason or other but i've got no explanation i can't tell you folks i can't tell you so moving on well we spent three days i'm moving up to uh up to up to current now we're getting away from the uh, from the recap so after the three days in western sahara and the 500 odd miles of driving we eventually exited the minefield possibly into an even more slightly dangerous place and that of course is mauritania now if you look at the fco advice on mauritania they will tell you that you probably shouldn't travel in mauritania at all Certainly the interior Sahel region is really very much a no-go zone. Now we were again following the coastal route, so certainly not quite as dangerous a place to be, uh, but there's little doubt that Mauritania is still a risky country to be in, that is for sure. So caution is required, um, you know, if I was to take you back to 2007, uh, not a nice time at all, but unfortunately some French tourists were actually killed uh, by an Al-Qaeda cell in, in Mauritania. So caution definitely had to be exercised there. Now, interestingly, the official Paris-Dakar rally uh, was actually cancelled in 2008, uh, owing to kind of concerns within the Sahel region in Mauritania. Now, if you fast forward just a single year, uh, the Paris-Dakar as a whole was actually moved to South America for a whole decade, uh, and that was all owing to the difficulties and, and the possible sort of dangers uh, within the country. Now, funnily enough, in 2010, the, uh, the Plymouth Banjo or the Plymouth Dakar uh, was actually also called off um, owing to this sort of terrorist threat in Mauritania. Uh, but actually, some of the teams decided still to do it, uh, which probably does give you a bit of an insight into, uh, into the mindset of some of the people doing this challenge. So we weren't actually the only ones to arrive in Mauritania. And although the Paris Dakar doesn't technically run, there was still some kind of official rally, uh, some kind of official rally uh, going on through this part of North Africa. So you can see here this uh, sort of fully prepped, uh, you know, off-road rally car uh, with its own truck. It has its own truck of spare parts. And in essence, folks, that is the difference between a 200 pound Peugeot and a 100,000 pound fully prepped go anywhere Saharan rally vehicle. Uh, but what I would say is I did save myself quite a lot of money doing it my method. So you've got to be happy with that. OK, so we're now in Mauritania proper, and I just wanted to highlight Mauritania on this uh, satellite map. And the reason for that is you can really see the flowing desert sands in this part of Mauritania. So whereas Western Sahara was quite arid and quite scrubby and quite rocky, not really, uh, you know, the big dunes that you imagine, Mauritania really does have these big Saharan dunes. It's a really, really epic place. Uh, it also has lots and lots of amazing coastal shipwrecks. Um, and in fact, I'm, you know, I, I'm really sad that I didn't get to explore a few of these wrecks a little bit more, uh, get a little bit closer, but we just didn't have time. So, you know, it has so many wrecks, it's kind of similar to, uh, you know, other more renowned sort of shipwreck countries, places like Namibia uh, and Mozambique, which of course have a lot dotted along their, their sort of sandy coasts. Now, Mauritania also has the world's rarest pinniped. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I'm talking about the Mediterranean monk seal. Uh, but what do I even mean by pinniped? Well, essentially a pinniped uh, is a type of aquatic fin-footed mammal. Uh, so there's 34 uh, pinnipeds around the world as a whole. And the adult Mediterranean monk seals, they can be two and a half meters long uh, and up to a quarter of a ton in weight. So they really can grow very, very big indeed. Uh, now the Mediterranean monk seal, as I said, it's thought to be the very rarest of them all. And actually very sadly, there's only around 600 uh, Mediterranean monk seals remaining. Now, the small population of them within those kind of 600 or so, they're, they're kind of scattered within three isolated subpopulations. So you've got the population uh, on the Mauritanian islands. Uh, there's a small population in Madeira 
and also along the Turkish coastline as well. Now, unfortunately, their declines across the Mediterranean, uh, you know, as with many animals, kind of relate to uh, the degradation of their habitat. Uh, now, of course, the Mediterranean and North Atlantic as a whole, it's a very, very heavily trafficked sea. Uh, that, of course, is a huge issue for them. But they also face a lot of competition from fishermen um, and just a, a sort of lack of effective conservation planning uh, to really look out for them. So beautiful creatures. And I should say I didn't actually see any Mediterranean monk seals on this trip. Uh, unfortunately, you really would have to travel uh, to some of the offshore islands. Now, Mauritania also has the Rishat structure. Now, if any of you ever heard of this, then you'll know how fantastic it is. It is absolutely sublime. Look at that, it's incredible. So it's just this huge kind of geological feature uh, in Mauritania. And I should probably say, this isn't my photo, just for anybody who was thinking uh, that I might have taken this, this is probably a little bit without, a little bit out of the limits of a drone, shall we say. So this of course is a satellite image of, of the Rishat structure. And it's really, really big. I mean, it's absolutely massive. And it's also known as the Eye of the Sahara. I absolutely love that. There's something very, uh, almost kind of Lord of the Rings about the rich hat structure, I think. And the truth of it is that nobody really knows 100% uh, how it was formed. And it doesn't seem to have been formed by uh, an impact crater. Uh, it seems like it may have been sort of extrusion of igneous rock, but nobody really knows everybody. Uh, and what I can also tell you is I've given everybody a great game here because you can now get onto Google Earth and try and find the rich hat structure in Mauritania. And I mean, that's got a while away some time during lockdown as well. So um, yeah, no worries there. Okay, so a little bit about Mauritania. Well, it's officially named the Islamic uh, Republic of Mauritania and it's the 11th largest sovereign state in Africa. And it really is one of the world's poorest countries. In fact, it became so apparent uh, on driving around Mauritania, just how poor it was. It really was very sad. Now, around about 90% of Mauritania's land mass is actually within the Sahara. So if you think back to that, uh, that sort of satellite map that I showed you and just how spread uh, across the whole country the Sahara was. Now, it has of course faced severe drought over the years. And because of that, you know, the Sahara has been continually expanding uh, since the 1960s. And that of course puts more and more of Mata uh, Mauritania uh, within its sort of uh, sands. Now the capital is known as Nouakchott and it's located on the Atlantic coast and it's home to about one and a half million uh, of the country's sort of four and a half million odd people. Now along with Morocco, Mauritania also annexed Western Sahara in 1976 uh, but they suffered very very heavy military losses uh, from the Polisario so Mauritania eventually withdrew uh, in 1979 and of course Western Sahara is still very much disputed now. So the vast interior of Mauritania is known as the Empty Quarter, and it's just this huge region of sand dunes uh, that kind of merges into the, uh, the, the endless Sahara. Looks like an absolutely incredible place to visit, uh, but of course it is quite dangerous uh, in the interior, so you might want to uh, bear that in mind. Okay, so we were now getting ready for the Sahara. It's probably what you've all been waiting for. It's what the whole presentation is supposed to be about. So, here we are in convoy, uh, pretty much ready to go. We've just entered Mauritania. Now, what I can tell you here, folks, is out of the 12 vehicles, there is actually 13, but one's a taxi, so we won't worry about that. Out of the 12 vehicles, six of these vehicles are four-wheel drive, and six of these vehicles are two-wheel drive. Now, what I need to tell you, everybody, is that four-wheel drive equals cheating. And obviously, the reason I can say that is because I was in a two-wheel drive, and there didn't seem to me to be too much point in making it too easy. So here's our guide, Dahid, wonderful guy, getting us all ready to go. Um, and this just meant that we needed to do a little bit of preparation on the cars. Uh, so essentially what I'm doing here is deflating the tyres, taking pressure out of the tyres. And the reason for this is you want your tyres acting more like a snowshoe. You want that extra surface area to give you traction, to give you grip in the sand. So what you actually do is you drop your tyres down to about sort of 10 uh, 12, maybe 15 PSI, something in that region. And that really will enable a two wheel drive car to get a surprisingly long way on sand. Now, what I would say folks is don't do this at home. Please do never do this at home. It's a terrible, terrible thing to do. Uh, and what it involves is basically putting pieces of wood inside your coil springs in order to raise the ride height of your car. Now, the reason to do this is just to give you a bit more ground clearance because the thing that certainly surprised me uh, was just how bumpy even the flat parts of the Sahara were. 
In fact, there are very few flat parts of the Sahara, I have to say, which is probably not a huge surprise. Now, what tends to happen if you do this, even if you've cable tied these bits together, eventually you'll go over a huge bump uh, and these will be evicted from your suspension, at which point they then get fired around your wheel arch, kind of like somebody's firing a machine gun at for you, a machine gun at you, sorry. So it does mean you then need to get out of the car and untangle them from your suspension. So these were soon abandoned uh, as an idea and uh, I stuck to the original wide height of the car, which generally was okay. Okay, so we left very, very early uh, to start crossing the Sahara. And we're very lucky because we actually caught sight of one of these beautiful foxes. This fox is the fennec. Now, the fennec, uh, unfortunately, nobody managed to get a photograph of this fennec. It was a very, very fleeting glimpse. So I have borrowed some photos here. But the fennec is the very smallest of the world's foxes. It really is a beautiful little thing. Uh, it really looks like it's borrowed its ears from another species as well. <laughs> They're just absolutely massive. Um, it's largely a nocturnal species, and that, of course, does help it to deal with the scorching desert heat. Now, one of the reasons why we perhaps saw this fennec early in the day uh, was because we were there in January, and the Sahara actually wasn't anywhere near as hot as it does get. Um, so perhaps that was, that was part of it. Now, the fennec has quite a few sort of desert adaptions, and obviously it has these huge ears which help to radiate heat, so they help to, heap it, uh, help to keep it cool in the heat of the day. It also has a very, very long, hairy coat, and they both insulate it when it's cold, but they also protect it uh, when it's very, very hot. And then much like lowering the uh, tire pressure on the Peugeot, they have these hairy feet that act just like snowshoes. I didn't have hairy tires, obviously, but I'm talking about the, uh, the surface area. So these feet act like snowshoes and they stop the fennec from, uh, from burning its feet on the desert sand. Now the fennec uh, lives in small communities and very much like our own fox, you know, they mark their territories with, uh, with urine like other canids. They're a very, very opportunistic feeder, which of course you would need to be in desert conditions. Uh, and of course, I mean, they're pretty adorable, aren't they? They really are pretty adorable, but unfortunately that appearance, uh, it makes them a real favorite for the captive uh, pet trade, which is very, very sad indeed. Okay, folks, so we're in Mauritania, and now we're entering uh, the national park of uh, Bon de Gon. Now, if you have an appalling grasp of languages like me, an absolutely terrible grasp of French, you may well uh, think of Mauritania and think of Bon de Gon as Bank de Arguin. Now, I was very quickly corrected on that, thankfully, before I made myself look like too much of an idiot. Uh, but unfortunately, I've just done that on, uh, on a national webinar, so I probably shouldn't have admitted to that. But, but never mind. Too late now. Too late now. So Bondagon National Park, absolutely superb. It is an absolute mecca for birds. It is just phenomenal. Really, really beautiful place. So, you know, it comprises uh, kind of beautiful sand dunes, coastal swampland, lots and lots of small offshore islands and really kind of rich, shallow, you know, lagoon waters. Uh, it really is, you know, one of the world's most important places for nesting birds, but also Palearctic migrant waders. And this, of course, is because Bondagon sits on the Eastern Atlantic Flyway. So that means many of our migratory Palearctic species actually pass through Bondagon on their way down to Sub-Saharan Africa. So there may well be up to 40,000 pairs of wading birds there. What I can tell you folks, from the brief amount of time I spent there, the bird watching there would be absolutely phenomenal. Um, so if we are allowed to go away again, then definitely get yourselves to Bondagon. It's absolutely beautiful. Now, of course, the contrast between the sort of desert landscape and the, the, the wealth, uh, you know, the kind of biodiversity within those kind of shallow waters, you know, it's resulted in this seascape of, of kind of real, you know, natural and national significance. Uh, it's a really, really important place. And it's actually all the offshore islands that are home to those Mediterranean monk seals that I talked about, but also a huge number of seabirds. So here, you know, you would be seeing uh, some fantastic tern species, things like Caspian terns and royal terns and oh, just an endless assortment of birds. Um, you know, I'd be here for quite a long time if I was able to tell you them all. Fantastic place. So, of course, driving through Bondagon National Park did mean that quite a lot of desert repairs needed to be conducted. Now, it is possible that this repair uh, may have been part of my own doing. And that, of course, is the uh, the magnificent engineering uh, that I undertook right at the beginning of this challenge. But what I would say, folks, is that if I had had that sheet metal bender, uh, obviously I would have done a better job on this and uh, I wouldn't have had this problem. But, you know, we'll, we'll skip over that nonetheless. Now, of course, some of my, uh, some of my teammates had similar problems. 
a few issues with tyres here. Uh, what I would say, everybody, is that if your tyre looks like this in the UK, uh, it's certainly not going to pass the MOT, and it is rather on the dangerous side. Uh, of course, you can see all the, uh, the, the exposed metal wires sticking out of the tyre there. Now, of course, when you're in the Sahara, uh, the need for fantastic tyres is not so great. Uh, obviously, having blowouts is a little bit unfortunate, but this tyre was just about rescued on time. Now, of course, the sand didn't always prove for smooth sailing or driving, and it was probably a little bit inevitable that at some point I would get stuck in the sand. I have to admit, I did get stuck in the sand. But the one thing I would say is this only happened one time uh, throughout the whole of the Sahara, which I was very, very proud of for a front wheel drive. Now, almost everybody got stuck at some point, including most of the four wheel drives. Uh, so that was rather a proud moment for me. And what we're all doing here is we're actually lifting the car and we need to lift the car because we need to be able to put it uh, either on pieces of carpet uh, or basically what's known as a sand ladder that you can see at the front here. And this is to enable the car to get some traction uh, in order to get the speed sort of going again, get the momentum going. Now, obviously parts of the Sahara were rather barren, rather barren, and I would say flat. Again, it looks flat here, but it's not flat, folks. It's not flat, it's very, very bumpy. Um, but the thing is, it was very hard to see anything in the distance. So of course, in this photo, you can see that there are two cars in front of me. But any time when you got further away from objects, you just couldn't tell what they were. So I might be looking at something and thinking, well, is it an acacia tree? I can't tell. Is it a car? It might be, I've no idea. Is it a camel? It could be. Uh, is it an oasis? I mean, who knows? You just could not tell. It was almost impossible. And this, of course, meant that following people sometimes became very, very difficult. So there was a lot of looping around to find people uh, who'd gone a little bit off the beaten track, uh, but nobody got lost permanently. So always well that ends well. Now, the car also exhibited some rather strange behavior. Uh, and one of the things that it did was actually the, the trip computer was reset to zero. Uh, and when I say the trip computer, I'm not talking about the temporary trip computer. I'm talking about the car's overall mileage uh, bizarrely reset itself to zero. So to all intensive purposes, I had a brand new car, everybody. Uh, unfortunately, about an hour later, uh, the car remembered its previous mileage and it went back again. So I had a, a new car for a very brief amount of time, um, but very strange behavior nonetheless. So anyway, this brought us to the first night of camping in the Sahara and it was epic. Ah, oh, the tranquility. I, I really wish I could encapsulate it for you in words. It was just a phenomenal place to be. A uh, beautiful sunset, absolutely no doubt about that. We just had the most idyllic spot, folks. It was absolutely perfect. So you can see here us all camped together in a big circle. And part of the reason for that was just to sort of keep those desert winds at bay uh, and to stop us from being quite so affected by them in the night. Because, of course, the Sahara was getting very, very cold at night. Now, what I have done, folks, is I've got a little 360 degree mini video here for you. And it's just to give you an all an idea uh, of what sunrise in the Sahara was like. So I've even left a bit of the wind noise in there uh, just to, so you can get a bit of the, uh, the sort of atmosphere from it. There you go, folks, sunrise in the Sahara for you. Now, I know what some of you were thinking. You're thinking, why on earth did you want to go somewhere so barren? Um, I've not got an answer for you, but all I can tell you is it was absolutely phenomenal. So, of course, being in the Sahara, uh, such an inhospitable place, but surprisingly, a lot of wildlife still survives there. You know, nature always finds a way. You know, species of bird like this wonderful desert wheat ear. In fact, the wheat ear families as a whole are really, really prolific in desert regions. And there's a number of species uh, across this part of Africa. 
brown neck raven there as well, uh, very, very similar to our own uh, raven species. Now, of course, no desert, however, would be complete without camels, folks. Without camels, you can't have a desert without camels, can you? So, of course, the Arabian or dromedary camel, a uh, very, very familiar sight in that part of Africa. Uh, and what a superb animal it is. So, you know, they can be over seven foot tall at the hump and weigh more than 700 kilos. Just in case any of you were thinking, well, how much is that in comparison to a Peugeot 406? It's around about half. It's about half the weight of a Peugeot 406, folks. There you go. Now, uh, the hump can actually store over 35 kilograms of fat. Of course, it's that common misconception that the camel stores water in its hump. And this fat can be broken down uh, into sort of energy as well. You know, they have this legendary sort of traveling ability in the desert. They can travel up to about 100 miles uh, between drinks. Now, camels really sweat. So even in temperatures reaching 45 degrees Celsius, they lose very, very little moisture. And this, of course, is what keeps them going for such a long time. Now, they have a serious drinking habit. Um, you know, they really, really do. Uh, not booze, of course, not booze, but they can drink over 30 gallons of water in just over 10 minutes, uh, which is pretty phenomenal statistic. Now, they have a lot of desert adaptions, of course, as well. They have these uh, an ability to close their nostrils uh, to prevent uh, sort of sand from entering. Of course, those big bushy eyebrows and those really long lashes. Uh, and of course, that's to keep the sand out of their eyes. They have these very tough rubbery lips that enable them to chew uh, on the thorny desert scrub and those large thick foot pads uh, to kind of spread their weight out over soft sand uh, and to stop their feet from burning as well. So a fantastic animal. Now, unfortunately, not every car uh, made it through the Sahara. And what I can tell you, everybody, is if you're thinking of taking your Honda Jazz to the Sahara Desert, it may well not make it. And there's a specific reason for that, and it's to do with front overhang. Now, as I said, the Sahara is very, very bumpy, and driving through it means your car will take some absolutely enormous frontal impacts. Now, the problem is when you have a car like a Honda Jazz with a very short front overhang, you have very little protection for the cooling system. And unfortunately, well, I'm sure you'll all have guessed, but a cooling system in a desert is rather an essential component. Uh, so unfortunately, that was pretty much the end of the Honda Jazz. Uh, and then we had to put one of the four wheel drives to work uh, to tow the poor little Jazz uh, out of uh, Bondagon. Now, there was just a little bit of time for a little bit of beach exploration before leaving. Uh, there was a fantastic whale skeleton at Bondagon National Park headquarters, really superb. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to see these fish alive, of course, um, but I did find a marbled electric ray on the beach uh, and also quite a few spiny dogfish as well. Now, I'm fairly sure these were probably a result of uh, fishing bycatch, which is very sad, uh, but I thought I'd pop them in there for your, uh, for your interest anyway. Lots and lots of birds there, as I said, uh, a huge wealth of birds that I, I couldn't even begin to cover. Lots of great white pelicans in Bondagon, fantastic to see them. Now, I did take a beach walk at one point, popped my head into a sheltered estuary just to have a little peek. I just about had enough time. And what I can tell you, folks, is there was thousands of wading birds in this estuary. It was absolutely ridiculous. I, I was so devastated uh, that I didn't have longer to, uh, to stay there and scope them all out. But unfortunately, uh, we had to leave. So after three days and about 350 kilometers on sand, uh, we came to the exit of Bondagon National Park and we headed towards the capital of Mauritania, which is Nouakchott. Now, Nouakchott is, um, it's, it's quite a place, everybody. It's quite a place. Um, now, you're probably wondering what I mean by that. And if I was to tell you that it was voted uh, one of the world's 20 least livable cities uh, at one point in time, then that might give you a rough idea uh, what uh, Nuak Chot is like. It's certainly an interesting experience. What I can tell you, however, folks, if you're very keen to get to space, then the budget space travel agency is actually located in Nuak Chot. Uh, so if you do want to get yourself into orbit, then I recommend uh, a quick trip over there and get yourself into the space travel agency. A surprising find, I, I think you'll agree. Now, we did also head down to the, uh, to the beach around sunset in Nuak Chot. Uh, to see what most of the locals uh, are sort of doing for employment and it, of course it's fishing uh, you know fishing is is a real um, you know it, it it is what it is the employment there essentially it's, it's what people are doing so the beaches were certainly very very busy 
Uh, really, really kind of fascinating to watch this unfolding. Uh, Nuoktra also homes probably some of the worst cars I've ever seen uh, anywhere on my travels, anywhere in the world. They truly are sublime uh, in an interesting way. So some of you might remember back to part one where I showed you that really crusty old Renault, um, which still seemed to be used, actually. I'm pretty sure I saw somebody drive off, off in this car, amazingly. So, you know, lots of these cars, um, yeah, they're still going. It's, it's quite incredible. Now, unfortunately, that night, folks, things took a bit of a turn for the worst. Uh, and unfortunately, I started feeling a little bit ill. Now, that perhaps might be a bit of an understatement, because what I can tell you, folks, is I actually fainted that night on the way to the bathroom. And in actual fact, that's one of only two times in my life that I've ever fainted. Uh, so clearly what I had was not very good. And what I can tell you was that when I woke up in the morning, I really had lost quite a bit of weight. Uh, I was not looking my best, I have to say. Not good, not a good time, not a good time. But I did at least have a little friend to keep me company. I had a lovely little dog, lovely little dog who lived in the, uh, the grounds of, of the lodge we were staying in, christened Bob the dog. Bob the dog seemed very appropriate. He was a lovely little puppy. And I have to say, he, he really brightened things up for me when I was feeling pretty ropey. So in a very sickly state, I had little choice but to plow on towards Senegal. Now, what I would say is that the roads did not help matters. And I really do put roads in inverted commas because, well, the roads, I'm not really sure you would count them as roads. Um, they were pretty rough, I have to say. Now, what I can tell you, everybody, is that these photos, uh, the photos that I've chosen to take, actually, they don't do any justice to just how bad these roads were. Um, they were abysmal. They were abysmal. Some of the holds in these roads were probably up to half a metre deep. They were absolutely catastrophic. And in fact, it was a lot better to stay off the road uh, the majority of the time, because being on the road was really, uh, it, was, it was an accident waiting to happen. Now, here you can see the remainder of the road, folks. This is how much was actually left. Uh, it's a fairly thin strip of road. I, I think you'll, uh, you'll all agree. Now, what was the result of these roads? Well, the result of these roads for some people really was quite catastrophic because in fact, one of our group, uh, they hit an enormous pothole. And the result of this was it actually blew out three of the tires on their Citroen. It cracked the windscreen and it also stopped the car. And I don't mean stop the car in terms of stopping it physically in the pothole, although it did. Uh, it, the car actually thought it had had a crash. Uh, so it wouldn't restart because the electronic control unit said, I've had a crash, I shouldn't restart because it'd be very dangerous. So essentially, folks, you can actually have a crash in a pothole uh, on a road in southern Mauritania. Amazing, hey? Now, this brought us into Dialing National Park. Um, now, this park was a real dust bowl. I mean, most of the time, you just couldn't see anything. I could see nothing of what was in front of me. In fact, we spent a lot of time driving in a drainage ditch uh, in preference to actually driving on the road. So that gives you a bit of a sense of what the road quality was like. However, it did give us some really great opportunities to see some wetland birds. Uh, Dialing is actually a fantastic national park, so I don't want to denigrate it. Uh, birds like this incredible black heron. Now the black heron has this superb feeding strategy known as canopy feeding. Uh, it looks incredible. Obviously uh, seeing this heron canopy feeding is amazing, but there might be a few reasons for it. And one of them, it's very likely that, you know, fish actually seek out uh, the black heron thinking it's kind of suitable shade, you know, perhaps from an overhanging tree. It may also make it easier for the black heron to hunt. So, of course, putting the water in shadow means it might be able to see underneath the surface a little bit easier. And also the bird essentially turns into one large mass of shadow. So, of course, uh, the fish may well become, you know, a little bit more sort of confused by that. But there is possibly another option. Maybe this bird really just likes playing hide and seek. I don't know whether anybody's considered that, but, you know, seems plausible to me. Now, I did also see common warthog. I have to say, folks, these were not my photos of common warthog, uh, because the only photo I managed to get was actually of the backside of a common warthog uh, as it disappeared into the undergrowth. But, you know, it's a, it's a record shot. It's a record shot. So after five days and nearly 600 odd miles, you know, we finally exited the kind of the endless sands of Mauritania, uh, eventually arriving in sub-Saharan Africa. And what I can tell you folks is Mauritania had been absolutely incredible. 
I loved it and I would heartily recommend anybody to visit when they get the opportunity. Fantastic place. Having said that, moving into sub-Saharan Africa, it got a whole lot hotter. Seems bizarre, doesn't it? You know, I was in the Sahara and it was hot. I'll give you that. It was hot, but it wasn't as hot uh, as south of the Sahara. That was absolutely boiling. So we finally left the Palearctic region. Uh, and this is a, a sort of biogeographical region. Um, and we were entering the Afro-tropical region south of the Sahara Desert. So here we were in Senegal. Now the place we crossed is not actually marked on that map, uh, but it's somewhere in the top part of the map between St. Saint Louis and Rosso. Uh, it was a place called Diama. And we were actually issued with quite a few instructions uh, about the Diama crossing uh, from previous participants. And what I can tell you is that most of it made no difference because getting through this crossing was rather difficult. It was rather difficult. It took about half a day and it involved a lot of bribery, unfortunately. It's a very, very difficult border crossing. In fact, it is reputed as being the hardest border crossing in the whole of Africa. It is tough. So if you are planning to take your car to Senegal, uh, what I would say is that you probably need to budget on quite an expensive holiday. Now, getting into Senegal, we were, of course, emerging into this uh, dry sort of savanna woodland that so typifies the region. Uh, you've got the fantastic baobab trees there on the left for those big baobab fruit. The really, really spiny kapok trees or silk cotton trees. And of course, lots and lots of palms there as well. Now, this finally gave the opportunity for some much needed rest and relaxation uh, and some more relaxed birding as well. I was really looking forward to spending a bit more time uh, looking for wildlife. Now, I didn't have a lot of time, but I did have a little bit more time, which was great. That resulted in some fantastic bird species uh, like this Abyssinian roller, blue-bellied roller, broad-billed roller, and the Rufus Crown roller. As you can see, the rollers are absolutely fantastic. I've actually chosen to put these into the presentation in preference to bee eaters. Uh, I just think they're absolutely superb. Beautiful, beautiful birds. Now, also hornbills were very, very prominent. You've got the Western red-billed hornbill and the African grey hornbill, which is a more common species as a whole. Lots and lots of heron and egret species there, uh, species like this black-headed heron uh, and also western reef egret. So this actually is a very dark morph of western reef egret. They do also come in a white morph, uh, which is very much more typical, of course, of, uh, of the egret species that we see here in the UK. Now also, Palearctic migrants uh, were also uh, visible here. So oh, I seem to have lost, oh no, the text is there. Sorry, folks, yeah, the green shank. So the green shank up there for you and the wood sandpiper down at the bottom too. So these actually are two birds that you can see on passage migration in the UK. Uh, reserves like Rye Harbour, for example, will offer you very good opportunities to see green shank uh, and decent opportunities to see wood sandpiper as well. Now also very, very similar to our, I won't say familiar, but to the uh, UK stone curlew, is the Senegal thick knee. Uh, great name, <laughs> fantastic name. So this is a bird that I photographed in the uh, in the mangrove systems. Superb looking bird, really, really secretive and a great one to see. Lots of lapwing species there, spurred, uh, spur wing lapwing, and then also, as I said, different heron species, little squacko heron, uh, sort of nestled down in the vegetation here. And then more common sort of lapwing species like the spur wing, the African wattled lapwing too. And also some monkeys, started seeing monkeys uh, sort of sub-Saharan. And this is a very, very familiar monkey to this region. So this is the green monkey uh, the, or the, the savannah monkey. Um, now, some of you who sort of traveled extensively in Africa might be quite familiar uh, with this species as the vervet monkey. So the green monkey is essentially the uh, subspecies of, of kind of vervet that you would expect to see uh, in this part of Western Africa. Uh, beautiful little species. It is very, very active, always foraging on the ground. So they often allow you really, really close views. Okay, so what else did Senegal have? Well, Senegal also had oh, intense heat, everybody. Really, really intense heat. It was so hot. And in the built up areas, uh, you know, in the car with no air conditioning, where it was nearly 40 degrees, it was absolutely baking. And what made that a lot worse was the traffic. Uh, the traffic in Senegal, certainly uh, close to the towns, was absolutely horrific. Senegal also had the mightiest 
of almighty speed bumps. They were absolutely ridiculous. Now, OK, I appreciate this isn't actually an accurate depiction of the speed bumps in Senegal. But I tell you what, it's not far off. It's genuinely not far off. And the thing about Senegalese speed bumps, they're unmarked, everybody. They have no painting on them, no markings, nothing. They're completely blended into the road. And actually what happened was we first arrived in Senegal after the cover of darkness. And the reason for that was it took us almost the entire day to get through the border crossing. Now, the result of that was actually my, uh, my, my sort of friend in, in, in our sister Peugeot uh, actually hit a speed bump doing about 65 miles per hour. Uh, and the result of that was what I can only describe as a fireworks display, everybody. It was absolutely ridiculous, the amount of sparks that came off the underside of the car. Uh, so I could certainly see for a while anyway. That's that's the only uh, positive from that. OK, so another couple of days through Senegal, a few hundred miles. And that was another really, really busy country traversed. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Senegal can be pretty mad. Uh, certainly going towards Dakar um, is what I can only describe as insanity. Now, this signaled the final push to our last remaining country which was, of course, the Gambia, the end point for the whole challenge. So here we are on the ferry. Welcome to Banjul. There we go, arrival. So on the 12th of January, we finally crossed the River Gambia and arrived in Banjul. Now, fortunately, there was a little bit of time to enjoy the wildlife. I stayed at this lovely lodge, Abkas Creek Lodge. I can heartily recommend it. And there was also time to enjoy the beaches. And that, folks, I can tell you, came as a welcome relief. And the reason for that was it was really necessary. So I was still really suffering from the illness that I'd picked up in Mauritania. But fortunately, a local came to my aid uh, in the shape of the baobab tree. The baobab tree, folks, was to be my savior. So what I can tell you is that uh, if you find a friendly, uh, a friendly gentleman or, or lady and she juices a baobab fruit for you, creates a lovely, uh, fruit juice to soothe a, a, a terrible stomach, then obviously that's a good thing. Now, of course, if you have a baobab and a plastic bottle, then what you have is a lovely bottle of baobab juice. If, however, you add temperatures in Gambia, 38 degrees sunshine, uh, and then you add three days of baobab juice in a backpack in Gambian sunshine, what you end up with is what I can only describe, folks, as a grenade, you end up with a grenade. It, honestly, when I opened this baobab juice, I was in my lodge in Gambia and this thing went off like a grenade. In fact, it actually blinded me. I couldn't see for about five minutes. Not only that, it went off with such force uh, that my ears were ringing too. Uh, plus, of course, it covered pretty much the whole of the lodge in baobab juice. So what I can tell you folks is I looked something like this uh, after the event, which obviously was not ideal. Fortunately, I did get both my eyesight and my hearing back eventually. Okay, well, on to more normal things. So of course, now I'm in dry African savanna woodland, a wonderful habitat, absolutely superb for wildlife. So at the lodge, I was very, very lucky to have straw colored fruit bats there, absolutely beautiful, roosting there in the day, of course. And it also meant for a real kind of cacophony of noise. I really, really loved it. Some wonderful dragonflies, of course, surrounding the Gambia River. Really, really good place to see them. And some beautiful, beautiful birds like these purple glossy starlings. Now, I have to tell you, everybody, it is hard even in the photos to encapsulate the beauty of these birds. They've got these fantastic googly eyes as well. Uh, which give them real character. They're just one of my favourite birds out there. And I just want to show you this photo uh, that I took at the lodge, which will give you a real impression of what this bird is like. Wow. I mean, that, oh, the iridescence on the purple glossy starling is mind boggling. Honestly, everybody, it's probably one of the most beautiful birds I've ever seen. It is just absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. Love them. Love them. And they're a, they're, they're a reasonable family of birds as well. There's a few different uh, glossy starling species out there. Uh, another one being their, their relative, their close relative, uh, the long tailed glossy starling, which is also very, very beautiful. OK, folks, I've now got an aphidiophobia warning an aphidiophobia warning. So you're going to have to close your eyes. OK, 
Now, if, you, if any of you are thinking, well, what on earth is a philophobia? It's a fear of snakes, everybody. So if you don't like snakes, I'm afraid you're going to have to close your eyes for a couple of slides, but I'm going to tell you when to reopen them. So I did also find this fantastic puff adder, everybody. Now, I have to admit that I'm really happier than when I found a venomous snake. I absolutely love them. Brilliant. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the puff adder. So the puff adder is found in savannah and grassland across Africa. So you're going to find them everywhere apart from in the Sahara and within rainforest. Now, it tends to rely on this really kind of brilliant cryptic camouflage to not be seen, uh, but it's generally quite reluctant to move. Now, obviously, you're all going to be thinking, well, this one wasn't hard to spot. Um, and it's very true. It was actually digesting a meal, this snake. Uh, so it did have half of itself uh, actually sticking out from the surrounding vegetation. So you couldn't really miss it. Um, now, this snake it usually measures up to about 1.4 meters, but it can hit 1.8, up to about five kilograms. So this is a, a thick snake, and actually it can measure 40 centimeters around for the biggest examples. Now, it has a cytotoxic venom. So it's one of the, the, the most toxic venoms amongst vipers. Uh, generally, it will cause pain, swelling, blistering, uh, and tissue damage, but, but may lead to death as well. So this is a snake that generally will not hiss or strike when it's approached, uh, but it is quite a tempestuous snake. It can be quite aggressive. And for that reason, uh, it's actually thought to be responsible for more fatalities than any other, any other African snake. Now, there are a number of reasons for this, but bear in mind it has a very widespread uh, distribution across the continent. And that is probably one of the uh, predominant reasons. Fantastic snake, absolutely loved it. Okay, folks. We're snake safe once again. So if you don't like snakes, you can uh, you can return to the presentation and uh, and relook now. Okay, so lots of weaver birds there, uh, like these village weavers, very very common bird. And these weaver birds they weave these fantastically intricate nests uh, with the entrance holes underneath. Um, now actually that doesn't stop them from being predated by tree dwelling species of snake. Uh, but what I can tell you is I found a fantastic weaver bird nest. Uh, it was on the ground and it was absolutely perfect. And I, I cared for this weaver bird nest. Uh, I really looked after it. I really looked after it. Even amongst all my luggage coming back, I was really careful not to squash it. So anyway, I got it back to the UK and I think I was showing it off to my family uh, and I left it in, in a silly place. Uh, and this basically is what happened to it. And the reason this happened uh, was because it was down to my family dog. My family dog, Rosie, uh, who took it upon herself to uh, basically unravel the weaver bird nest. Uh, and obviously you can see here that Rosie's really grinning about that. She's uh, she's very happy um, that that's what she's done. So um, thanks, Rosie. You kind of ruined that one, really. Never mind. Anyway, what are the birds? Well, you know, I also bumped into the beautiful violet taraco, uh, a number of taraco species across Africa. Really, really interesting birds. Uh, other species like the Western Grey Plantain Eater, very similar species to the Taracos, closely related. And one of my very favourite flycatchers, I absolutely love this bird. This is a male and it's the African Paradise Flycatcher. Ah, oh, superb, just a superb looking bird uh, with a name that really sums it up. So, so exotic, really beautiful. Now, also, I came across a lot of squirrels out there. And the reason I've put a fairly, a fairly mundane looking squirrel in the presentation uh, is because somebody happened to ask me, uh, what is this? What squirrel species is this? Now, truthfully, everybody, I had absolutely no idea. But, you know, I was thinking, well, I'm in Gambia and it's a sunny country, so it's probably a Gambian sun squirrel. So anyway, I came back to the UK. I looked it up uh, in a mammals book. And would you believe it? I kid you not, there it is, folks, the Gambian sun squirrel. So I actually guessed the, na the name of this species uh, without even realising. So I can only assume that somebody was very much on the same track uh, when it came to naming this squirrel in the first place. So there we go. So what else was that? Well, there's an awful lot of raptors out there, a lot of birds of prey, everybody. More than 60 species uh, of bird of prey to be found in Senegal and Gambia as a whole. A lot of vultures out there. This is probably the most numerous vulture that you'll see. Uh, it is the hooded vulture. Now, like a lot of vulture species, it's an endangered species. You know, vultures across the planet are really suffering. They're in real trouble. And they're also fantastic. You know, we absolutely rely on them uh, for disposal. You know, they really are the, the kind of the garbage bins uh, of the natural world. They're absolutely critical. So we must do everything we can uh, to, uh, to make sure to protect vultures. 
Now, of course, the hooded vulture is perhaps not the most uh, attractive of vulture species. Uh, they have that bare skin uh, on the head and neck, which of course enables them to, uh, well, essentially to put their heads inside carcasses uh, and it makes it easier for them to clean their heads so they don't get blood and gore on the feathers. So that is the purpose of that. Lovely griffin vulture here as well. Now I should say this griffin vulture actually photographed at a rehabilitation center uh, in, a in a Buco nature park in Gambia. It wasn't actually a wild griffin vulture. Okay, palm nut vulture as well. Uh, so named because they really do feast on palm nuts. Uh, it's one of their favored food sources. Very large wide winged vulture, fantastic thing to see. Uh, they will feed on uh, other sort of small animals as well as palm nuts, but it's certainly uh, one of their favored food sources. So lots of yellow-billed kites out there. The yellow-billed kite is a, is a subspecies of the much more numerous black kite, which you can find pretty much all around the planet. In fact, it is one of the world's uh, most common birds of prey. And also a, a lovely grey version of our own kestrel, uh, the rather appropriately named grey kestrel. Beautiful bird there, absolutely stunning. So there's also a lot of excipiter hawks out there, uh, species like this dark chanting goshawk, very similarly related to our own sparrowhawks and goshawks and rather amusingly named lizard buzzard. Now, I could never get a photo of a lizard buzzard uh, that wasn't hiding behind a tree branch. In fact, <laughs> these birds, they just will not reveal themselves in the open. So I can guarantee whenever you see one, there'll always be a tree in front of it. But feel free to send me a photo of a lizard buzzard that doesn't have a tree in front of it. Now, you might also see African harrier hawk out there. It's a very, very unique bird. And that is because the adults have this big patch of bare skin on the faces, really, really unmistakable. Now, very similar to our own sparrowhawk, there's a species of excipiter out there called the shikra. Now, the shikra is even tinier than a Eurasian sparrowhawk. It's only around 30 centimetres, so it's a really, really small raptor. Very, very pretty bird, that one. Okay, folks, I got a lot of owls as well. I found a couple of species of owls out in Gambia. And one of them was this, the Varose Eagle Owl. Fantastic looking bird. So you can see here actually as an adult uh, with a juvenile as well. So I was very, very lucky to come across this. Now, as far as I'm aware, the Varose Eagle Owl is the only species of owl to have pink eyelids. <laughs> Would you believe it? Pink eyelids, everybody. I hope you can all see that in the photo. Now, I did also see a northern white-faced owl. Now, just in case you're thinking, oh, there's not even an owl there. What is this, some kind of where's Wally picture? Well, I have circled it for you, folks. There you go. There's the northern white-faced owl for you. Unfortunately, I couldn't get a clear view of this owl. Uh, it was determined to, uh, to kind of be within the foliage. And it was also very, very high uh, up in the tree. OK, everybody. Well, fortunately, the Gambia River uh, enabled quite a bit of sort of kayaking uh, amongst the mangroves, which was great for birding. Absolutely superb. And it also means that I had the opportunity to come across some West African or desert crocodiles. Now, this is not to be confused with a sni sorry, the significantly larger and more dangerous Nile crocodile. Now, one of the friends with me on this trip was absolutely petrified uh, that we'd come across any crocodiles, uh, whereas I was practically rubbing my palms with, uh, with, with glee at the thought of coming across some crocodiles. I absolutely couldn't wait. So that was fantastic. Now, we did also come across a lot of Western red colobus. So the Western red colobus is, a, is an old world monkey. Um, and there's actually a number of red colobus species across Africa, uh, although this species in Gambia is, is the nominate species. Now, colobus is actually derived from the Greek word for cripple, and it's owing to their lack of thumbs. Uh, now, they have exceedingly long tails, which obviously helps them to uh, balance while they're in the tree canopy. Uh, and they're a, they're a kind of they're a day living species. Uh, they they don't descend to the ground in the same way that the green monkeys do, but they do still tend to live in these large communal groups of sometimes up to eighty individuals. Now they have really interesting stomachs actually because they're really well equipped to deal with toxic foliage uh, that other monkeys just can't cope with. Um, they are, however, really endangered. You know they face both a whole host of natural predators. Uh, things like leopards, larger eagle species, and chimpanzees. In fact, chimpanzees prolifically hunt uh, colobus monkeys. Uh, and it goes without saying, they do also face a whole number of human-induced threats as well. Okay, everybody, well, the last thing I'm going to finish on, lots and lots of ospreys out there as well. In fact, I went on one coastal walk, uh, and I was quite amazed to have six ospreys hunting around me at the same time. Absolutely superb. Oh, it's absolutely brilliant. Couldn't believe it. 
Now, this Osprey was actually having a really, really hard time. And part of the reason for that was it was desperate to fish. It really, really wanted to fish this small water body uh, where I was patiently waiting. But it couldn't do that because there was an African harrier hawk, a juvenile in this case, that just would not stop harassing it. In fact, actually, in fact, this harrier hawk was really uh, living up to its name. It was really harrying this osprey and making life very difficult. But eventually the osprey got its way uh, and it did manage to catch a superb fish, uh, which rewarded me with this really, really nice photo uh, of an osprey uh, fishing this water body right in front of me. I was very, very pleased indeed to capture that. OK, folks, well, that pretty much marks the end of the journey now. Um, so what I can say is that, you know, funds raised from the sale of the car, uh, they went towards local causes in Gambia, which was a really kind of nice way to finish things off. Apart from one Honda Jazz, of course, one Honda Jazz did not make it all the way uh, to Banjul, unfortunately. And here are all the cars in there. Well, I was about to say final resting place, but actually that's not at all the case. Very much not the final resting place because these cars are actually going to uh, live an awfully long life in Africa. So by the 11th of February, uh, the majority of the cars had been sold and they raised nearly £10,000 overall. So with that, 4,071 miles had been completed by me in my trusty Peugeot 406. And it would event, well, it would now see out the rest of its life in Africa. And I do hope that it's doing well out there. I do miss that car. It was a fantastic uh, companion on what can only be described as an epic adventure. Absolutely phenomenal. That's it, folks. That is everything. So we all survived. I made it back in one piece uh, and had an absolutely mind blowing time. Saw some incredible wildlife. It really was uh, the trip of a lifetime. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. And I really, really hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you. Well, thank you, James. That was brilliant. I've really, yeah. I've really enjoyed the last, uh, the last two presentations. It's been, I think it's been great, especially since we've all been stuck in and no one's, no one's traveling anywhere. It's been nice to enjoy your holiday. Absolutely. Uh, instead, so uh, I've got some questions. Actually, if I change, should I just change my uh, do the old share screen thing? Should I? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stop the share. You know, if, you, if you stop that, and I'll um, so if I press this, I go over here. Is that right? Okay, let's let's do that, and I'll do that, and do that. There we are. I've got some questions here. Um, now, a friend asked, uh, so how many times <laughs> did, you, did you break down during that trip? How many times did I break down? Um, not, uh, not, not mentally, but <laughs> mentally many times, mentally many times. During the illness, I would say I was breaking down on a, well, a very, very regular occurrence. Uh, I have to say, friend, the car was absolutely phenomenal. Um, I, re I really can strongly recommend an old Peugeot for driving around Africa. Um, I, we didn't actually break down. We genuinely didn't break down. We, we had incidents which um, sort of caused a bit of mechanical repair. But the one thing that surprised me was other than a bit of a cooling problem, that car genuinely drove uh, as well as uh, it drove as well in Gambia uh, as it did when I left the UK. Staggering, staggering. Uh, speaking of breakdowns, uh, David's very concerned about the Citroen. Uh, did it get going again? Did it make it to the end? <laughs> the, the Citroen did. It did. Amazingly, it did. Yeah. So there were actually there were enough spare tyres within the group um, to get that Citroen Zara Picasso back on the road. Uh, you know, a broken windscreen, no real problem. Once the car had worked out that it had a crash and it was OK, uh, back on the road. Yeah, it made it all the way to Gambia. So there you go. There you go. The Citroen survived. Uh, a few people asked, uh, Stephen, Sarah, uh, ask, uh, were you, were you travelling on your own for the journey? No, no. So we, I mean, the, the group as a whole, we had about, um, I think there was about 18 cars in total, but only 12 of us crossed the Sahara together. There were a couple of uh, fragmented splinter groups which i won't go into they were interesting um in the car uh, actually I, I i just uh, i traveled with my now ex-girlfriend that was the only person i had with me and uh, and clive asked did you do all the driving i did yes i did do all the driving and 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 i have to tell you everybody that's not because i am a, a catastrophic control freak uh it's just because um my ex-girlfriend was was a, a very very uh, nervous and unconfident driver, even in the UK. So she certainly wasn't too keen to drive across the Sahara. But to be honest, I was quite happy to do all the driving. I loved it. It just meant I couldn't look as much wildlife as I wanted to. Okay, well, two, two final questions here. So Ricky's asked, uh, what was your favorite country? Oh, 
that's a toughie. That is a real toughie. Um, I think it was Mauritania. Yeah, it was Mauritania. Mauritania was just, I mean, the whole experience in Mauritania was so unique. Um, obviously, you know, the, the, the wildlife in Senegal and Gambia was, was phenomenal. And I love that aspect of it, um, as it was in parts of Mauritania. But the whole experience in Mauritania with the Sahara, uh, you know, with the guides, the people we met, it was just an absolutely superb place. Although I didn't like the illness. I really, really didn't like the illness. That was catastrophic. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, every, every time James comes back from his holidays, uh, uh, he always comes in the office and he, there's, there's something going wrong. Well, that sounds <laughs> a, huge, a huge gash in your forehead last time, I remember. There, is, um, yeah, there, was, there was a huge, that's, that's a, well, I mean, that's a presentation for another time. That's yeah. another story. Yeah, very well, true. We've got, we got plenty of time, James. You have to write that one up. <laughs> uh, and uh, and finally, finally uh, Jess asked, uh, what was the wildlife, the one wildlife highlight of the whole trip? And you can't include Bob the dog in there. Oh, Bob the dog. Oh, I love Bob the dog. Oh, God. I really wanted to adopt him and bring him back, actually. He was superb. Um, oh, wow. The wildlife highlight. That is so tricky. Um, there was just so much great wildlife. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I really, I'm not sure I can answer. There was, I mean, the, the bird life was so fantastic, you know, the whole way through the trip. It really was. It was great. I have to say, though, I do. I love finding venomous snakes. That's That's a big... That's always a big buzz for me. So the puff adder was really good. I really like that. Let's go with puff adder. Yeah, I could just, you know, I could be here naming different species for, for hours, really. That I, I mean, it's just brilliant. You know, I loved That's it. That's great. <laughs> well, thank you again, James. That was fantastic. That was epic. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thanks um, for and as always, just a quick run through of, um, as always, I've managed to somehow muck my computer up. Well, there we are. A quick run through of just some up, plenty of upcoming webinars over the uh, coming weeks to, um, keep you uh, entertained and educated and uh, distracted uh, from the situation that we're all in. Uh, on Thursday, uh, we've got so many people booked for this talk. We have to upgrade our Zoom account uh, for a year at Rye Harbour uh, with Dr. Barry Yates, who uh, seems to be ruling the internet at the minute by, uh, uh, by his very popular talk on Thursday. So, well, hopefully you've booked already, but I can't have any more people booked because I have to upgrade the, uh, the Zoom account again. I'm not really sure I can afford it. Um, <laughs> That's on Thursday, a year at Rye Harbour with, with Barry Yates. Then we have a year in the life uh, of the Wildlife Trust Ecologist with Glenn Norris. That's um, a members-only talk, and uh, I'm really looking forward to that. I've already seen it once, but I'm going to see it again. That's a really interesting talk about our reserves and the great wildlife you find uh, across Sussex. And then James and Barry and Charlotte and myself will be back uh, talking about all sorts of stuff on uh, Nature Table Live, uh, episode nine at the start of, of, uh, of February. Uh, uh, Laurie's back to do her small mammals talk on February the 9th. And even I'm going to get involved uh, and do a talk about moths um, on February the 11th. And also our friends at the SOS, the Sussex Ornithological Society, have got a series of talks as well. You can book these through our website too. It's their conference uh, this weekend, uh, Saturday and Sunday, with talks there about inclusivity and about uh, migration. That should be uh, really interesting. They also have some talks. Why do they keep doing this? What? Oh, I see. Yeah. There's a great talk by Matt Eve uh, coming up on uh, bird migration as well as a talk on the, uh, the wild new forest. So plenty to keep us, uh, keep us busy uh, in this, uh, these dark times. So I think that's it really. I think that's uh, what we've got to say. If you've enjoyed this evening's talk, uh, please consider making a donation. We have some lovely feedback and comments and some people leaving donations. It's really uh, encouraging. So I'm sure you really enjoy it. So if you want to show your appreciation for James's uh, epic journey, please make a donation. As we promised last week, James won't buy a new car uh, with, with the money. It'll all go to the conservation work I've got a car. Well, it's fine, it's fine, everybody. Uh, and again, when this webinar ends, uh, because I'm so clever, I've set it all up that uh, it'll take you to a page where you'll find details of how to book these talks, details of leaving a donation, uh, or how to join the Wildlife Trust. If you're not a member, we'd love to have you on board in 2021. There's also a link if you do want to drive uh, a battered out old car across, uh, across a minefield for charity, there'll be a link of how you can get involved and do that in the future. Good luck. <laughs> So again, big thank you again to James, uh, reaching the finish line uh -huh. down there in, uh, uh, there's a few hundred people, James, you can't see them all, but uh, if, we all, uh, if we all are going together, you can do this, uh, we could carry you across the finish line like Lewis Hamilton here. <laughs> so uh, thank you to James. Superb. Thank you to James <laughs> and thank you again to everyone listening tonight and tuning in. And. Uh,